British Manufacturing Podcast, brought to you by MTD, MFG and Jefferson. Hello and welcome to the Great British Manufacturing Podcast. On this week's show, we will review the latest positive news from the British manufacturing sector, including Rolls-Royce, Sheffield Forge Masters, Bentley, and a whole lot more. We also welcome a very special guest. Gareth Jones is the Managing Director at In Common Training. My name is Joe Reynolds, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Stuart Whitehead. But before we start, I'd like to give a mention to a couple of the businesses who have joined Factory Now this week. Um, new members are joining Factory Now platform every week, and it's been helped. To, you know, it's been launched to help British manufacturers boost sales, collaborate, reshore, and other things like that. Um, new members this week include uh, Worth UK, one of the largest suppliers of fasteners, fixings, and equipment. Um, Pro Tool Plastics Group have also joined this week. Um, the technical moulders with 30 years' experience in Farham and Manchester. So, yeah, please reach out to us if you're interested in joining the platform. Now, Stuart, there's lots of news this week. Perhaps we should start with uh, Rolls-Royce, one of the biggest stories of the week. Another really positive week, Joe. So Rolls-Royce is entering new aviation markets to pioneer sustainable power. And as part of that mission, the Derby-based firm will be developing energy storage systems that will enable aircraft to undertake zero, zero emissions flights of over 100 miles on a single charge. To deliver this technology, Rolls-Royce is investing £80 million in the programme over the next decade that will create 300 jobs, strengthen its position as a leading supplier of all electric, and hybrid electric power and propulsion systems for aviation. Yeah, it's a fascinating story, that one. One that got a lot of traction online, as you'd expect. But yeah, fascinating story. Another one, it's a large Japanese company, GS Uasa. Um, they're investing millions of pounds in Abu Bail. Yeah, absolutely. Another inward investment story. Japanese-owned battery manufacturer is, is creating over 100 new jobs and safeguarding 360 at South Wales factory in a, in a major expansion. The multi-million pound investment by the firm, supported with two and a half million pound funding for the Welsh Government, will help the increase production volumes and upgrade processes. For people unfamiliar with the company, the firm specialises in the development and production of lead acid and lithium ion batteries used across a wide range of industries, including the automotive, aerospace and defence sectors. And notably, the during the pandemic, these batteries also supplied power for the NHS Nightingale hospitals and other key medical projects. Yeah, no, fantastic. It's um, and the, the battery market's really heating up in the UK. But the, the next one, Prince is investing sixty million in, in Cardiff. Uh, I recall we've touched on this before. Yeah, it was announced um, last year. So this this is an update to that story. But another Japanese-owned company, the, the food and drink manufacturer, has completed the first phase, as you alluded to a planned £60 million investment to its Cardiff manufacturing site with the installation of seven new soft drink production lines in addition to a significant upgrading and refurbishment of two existing lines, commissioning of all the new lines is currently underway. And following the completion of the project, which is the group's largest ever, ever capital investment into soft drinks, overall production capacity at the South Wales site will be doubled with up to 130 new jobs created. Well, it's great to see investment, Stuart, not just in England, but, you know, this is Wales again, Great Britain as a whole. Absolutely. There's certainly a link now between uh, Japan and Wales, not just rugby. Yeah, indeed. Uh, so the next story is going to lead on lovely to uh, this week's guest, Sheffield Forge Masters, another recruitment drive for the uh, Sheffield-based company. Absolutely. So set to start in September, the firm is seeking applicants to join its highly regarded apprenticeship programme. Successful candidates will receive fully funded training, working towards a professional qualification whilst getting paid. A variety of roles are available, ranging from manufacturing and engineering through to marketing and quality control. A great opportunity to join Sheffield Forge Masters, a major employer in, the, in this city region with 600 employees and an apprenticeship programme which makes up around 10% of the workforce at any given time. Yeah, it's fascinating. Year on year, isn't it? You see dozens and dozens of apprentices each year joining Sheffield Forge Masters. It's a, you know, it's a fantastic company. Right, we'll, t- we'll take a break from the positive news. There is a lot more to come uh, after this week's guest. Uh, I'll take this opportunity to introduce Gareth Jones. He's the Managing Director of Incom. He's a very good friend. And Gareth, thanks for joining us. No, thanks very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so, let's jump straight in. So, can you, you know, who is Gareth? Talk talk us through your career to date, your current role, and I guess your journey to be where you are today. Yeah, so my name's Gareth Jones, Managing Director of Income Training and Business Services. Income was founded in 82, um, very much a family-orientated business. 
uh, great ethics, morals. Um, up until in recent years, you know, it, it's always had great people, great industrial connections and great engineering background, but not necessarily had the right facilities to take it to the forefront. So over the last six years, we've focused very much on investing in strategic partnerships with with industry. Without industry, we wouldn't exist. So it's vital that industry has been given the skill base to uh, for its sustainability and growth. And then also in equipment. So we've we've opened and developed a further three engineering manufacturing facilities across Shropshire and the, and the West Midlands uh, to the tune of investment of about seven million pound across nearly every aspect of engineering manufacturing. Yeah, it, it, it's unbelievable. I've been, I've, been, I've been to all of them, I think. And it, it's, it's, you do an incredible job, I must say. So can we dig a bit deeper with Incom? You know, who are you and, and what do you do? What, you know, what, what's, you know, what do you offer in terms of apprenticeships? You know, where does it start and where does it finish and what type of sectors and things like that? Yeah, yeah. So we cross all sectors, everything from aerospace, automotive, white goods, oil and gas, you, you name it, really. Um, we deliver across seven different sectors, uh, all to support the engineering and manufacturing base, everything from business support, which is more of the administrative marketing and customer service skills, uh, leadership and management, we deliver up to level five on leadership and management. Um, we do quality compliance, which is around um, quality installation of maybe ISO, AS standards, IATF. And we, we have consultants that go out and work with organisations, both micro, SME and large businesses to install and maintain our standards. Then we've got a continuous improvement sector. We deliver everything from Six Sigma down to the smaller, the short courses um, to support organisations to continually moving forward and streamline their systems and processes. We've got an health and safety sector. So for the health and safety compliance, again, we deliver the mainstream qualifications such as IOSH and NIRBOSH, but we've also got our own health and safety consultants. that We, we will literally manage people's health and safety contracts and manage services for them. We, we don't go in and tell people the time from their own watch. We actually get stuck in and do the doing. And then, of course, we've got the engineering manufacturing where we deliver technical upskilling. So that's bite-sized courses from everything from fluid power, CNC, EDM, CMM, robotics, the list goes on. And then we've got the apprenticeship base, which is probably 90% of our business at the moment. In engineering, um, we deliver across standards from mechatronics, which is electrical and mechanical maintenance, uh, machining, both CNC and manual um welding tool making press setter operating product design technical support literally the list goes on and all of these programs throughout the three academies have been built in strategic partnerships with industry so for instance on the fluid power section we partnered with imi norgren we bought the industrial components and, and made the 15 booths up on the fluid power and then we use their engineers to actually write the systems um, and training programs that we then put into the apprenticeships to then roll out to industry. And the same with the partnership on the CNC machinery. We've got a partnership with the Engineering Technology Group. And again, um, with the collaboration we've got there, we stay uh, up to date with equipment. So equipment is continually flipped out every six months. So we've got the latest CNCs in there. And again, we've used their engineers to build these training programs. So industry is getting what it needs, not from just a technological point of view, but also from a program point of view. Because the level of technology we've got across the three centres, so our main base is in Aldridge in the Black Country in the West Midlands, which is about 24,000 square foot of engineering manufacturing space. In 2015, we opened a smaller 7,000 square foot facility in Shrewsbury, and that was in partnership with SDE Technologies. Um, and then in 2017, we opened the March Centre of Manufacturing Technology, which is, um, there's four shareholders, which I know we'll go on to more, and that's Granger and Worrell, Salop Design and Classic Motor Cars. And again, it's all about the industrial application and what we can do to deliver a true industrial programme to the developing workforce of the future. Fascinating, Gareth. Thanks very much for the uh the overview and the uh, incredibly broad spectrum of services you offer. You touched upon the, the Marty Centre, um, which, you know, obviously you're a founder member of, um, but I believe that you're possibly moving or essentially moving to Telford, is, is that right? 
Yeah, so in um, we opened that in 2017 and, you know, we were in the parliamentary review for the first time because of the unique model that we've got in creating training space in true partnership with industrial partners. Um, that facility is based in Bridge North, which is on which on the Stanmore Estate, on the same site as Granger and Warren and Classic Motor Cars. And um, we were fortunate enough to access a grant at the time because the strategic location of that facility was to literally plug the north and south of the Marches region. So everything up as north as towards Telford, over to Shrewsbury, and further down towards uh, Hereford and Worcester. It literally is smack bang in the middle. Um, however, um, with the headwinds of Brexit, obviously the pandemic when that struck last March, and the rural locality of this training facility, it has proved quite difficult to get the uptake, not employer engagement, because we've delivered to something like 140 companies in the three and a half years that we've been open. And, you know, we, we, we've delivered over 1,200 courses in that time as well. So, you know, we've delivered some fantastic output, but the, the rural loca locality has been quite challenging. So we've taken the decision um, during the pandemic. I mean, the pandemic uh, has caused a number of different things. I think it's all enforced us to have a look at our own businesses and how we can do things quicker, faster and smarter. And, and uh, you know, we, we've heard some great innovation stories that have come out of the pandemic and people actually being dynamic to ensure the sustainability of their own companies and actually even new products to new markets, which, you know, I take my hat off to everybody who's uh, has done that. And we've been no different. We've analysed the business and gone, do you know what, whilst we're in this period of economic downturn, we're going to take the step to actually move the facility over to Telford, um, which is more of the ep epi epicentre hotspot for industrial engineering manufacturing within the North Marches region to ensure that the great work that we're delivering can be accessed by all. Um, we, are, we are taking our first intakes into the... I mean, this hasn't been broadcast to date, so this is probably the first time it has been broadcast widely. Um, our first intakes will be uh, operational from the new facility in Telford from the 13th of September. Fantastic, and very best of luck with that. Makes perfect sense, like you say, just with the pure geography of the, you know, the Marches Centre. Um, you touched upon earlier, uh, you work in collaboration with a number of engineering companies and manufacturers. You were certainly one of the pioneers, if not the pioneer of industry-led training. People less familiar with that approach. Could you explain the features and benefits and the advantages of, of, of that system? Yeah, so um, before the apprenticeship reforms back in 2015, when we wrote the business strategy, um, income has always been founded on firm, strong relationships with industry and also only having industrially competent engineers deliver on the training programmes. So, you know, if you've got... Um, a mechatronics maintenance engineer they need to be taught by a, mechano mechano a mechatronics maintenance engineer to ensure the true competency is passed on but the idea of working with industry so uh, obviously uh, industry in terms of education listen because then all of a sudden the apprenticeships came forward and during the reforms during the trailblazer set up it was about industry working together with a minimum of 10 organisations to generate the new apprenticeship pathways and should, what should be included in those. But we were already ahead of the market in terms of that. We'd already opened um, the, the, the Salop facility with a view to developing in common and what f further turned out to be the marches. As I've already alluded to, any training organisation, whether it be public or privately owned, whether it's colleges, um, etc., we only exist as a training organisation because industry exists and to have industry be told what's inside their training programme is absolutely brain dead. Every organisation has slight niches because that's where every organisation exists, whether it be the product, the way the work, systems, processes, routes to market. And they have to be actually realised. So working in true partnership with industry allows us to, as I've already said, Gain the latest access to technologies for today. But the important thing is, is to know where industry is going moving forward, to know to be able to plan for the future. 
what engineers actually look like inside companies now and what they're going to look like in the future and then we have to deliver the programs and design the programs in partnership with them as a provider it's very difficult or sorry it, it has historically been difficult to keep up with the pace of change of technology purely down to the level of investment and this was one of the key aspects as well as by having true strategic partnerships is to maintain that pace so we can actually support industry engineering manufacturing on their growth journeys i mean the average attrition rate for an, an, uh, a manufacturing engineering company i think the latest data said is about 11 percent of year so if an organization's even looking to stand still and you know this is this is the statistics that we've got coming out of working with our industrial partners to stand still they've either got to recruit or train 10 to 11 employees on an 100 workforce just to stand still and that's without growth so this is where you can see you really need to be looking at your three to five year growth strategy aligned to what that means on your human resource and skill base and again not just for today but for tomorrow we, all, we already know that electrification is ramping up, renewable energies is ramping up, and that's going to bring a diverse market in the engineering and manufacturing sector. And there's a lot of our SME base now already gearing up and or are already delivering into those sectors, and we have to be a true reflection of that. I mean, we're about to announce another strategic partnership probably towards the end of this year due to launch at the start of next, which will bring another niche into income. Um, but a very, very, very valued one to deliver on something that will allow us to take our business forward and also deliver for industry. That's fantastic news. We look forward to hearing more about that, Gareth. Um, final question for me. This is from one of our listeners. Um, we're all very aware of the skills or training gap in industry. In your opinion, are the government doing enough with their current initiatives to help resolve this? I think we are yet to find out because, um, okay, yeah, you can take control of what you do at home, which we have done in terms of the apprenticeship reforms. And I mean, under the Labour government in the late, late, well, late 90s, early noughties, especially, there was the Learning Skills Council that did a lot for MVQ-based qualifications. But MVQ-based qualifications are meant to be assessing competency. They're not designed to actually teach MVQs. And that comes from a technical certificate. And I think that was where a misunderstanding came from in yesteryear around MVQs, because I think people were expecting them to be training when not. It's, it's giving people qualifications based on their prior learning and competence from being in industry as a period of time. Because of the pandemic, because of Brexit, um, we, we still yet to find out what the training schedule is going to be. I know there was a white paper released, which I read thoroughly back in February. There's a pilot gone to bid now, and there's two elements to the bid. One, one element around the bid is for combined authorities and membership associations to be working with each other to actually pull down money to do an audit piece on industry. And that audit piece, the training for that, won't necessarily be based around qualifications. It'll be unregulated courses as well that will be designed moving forward. Then the other side to that is as well, training providers and delivery partners will be able to bid for capital investment to deliver against the need on that. That bid came out and had to be in about two weeks ago. And as I say, this is a pilot, but I think the government have already shot themselves in the foot because they've released both the audit piece and the capital piece at the same time. And a delivery's got to be happening at the same time. But how can you deliver when the audit hasn't been done? So I think that's one of the first mistakes that's already happened. But as I say, this is a pilot, so we're yet to see how that will unfold. Um, there was ed uh, adult education budget has been released. And predominantly, I mean, in our world, as I've just said, the, the, um, the funding that's attached to the white paper, there's only been allowed FE colleges to lead on anything um, put in bids in, which I think is wrong as well, because there's a lot of fantastic private training providers out there adding massive value, such as ourselves, to industry that have been excluded from these reforms. So I think that in itself is channeling money into establishments that cuts a large percentage of other providers out. So I think that's another failing there. But the adult education budget has come down. That's due to start delivering towards the end of the year. And that will be regulated programs 
for adults either already in work or trying to get into work. And it's going to be ever more important as we see furlough coming to an end in September and we start unmasking the true impact of what the pandemic's done. How many jobs are actually really going to be there? How many people have switched industries and how many people are going to want to be switching industries? Because engineering, manufacturing with the reshoring that we're seeing um, should only go one way. To have an healthy economy, you've got to be making product. And I think everybody understands that around the world. We have, we do make a lot of product here, but we do have a lot of R&D facilities of organisations that then choose to build abroad for whatever reason. And we want to see that coming back here. So long-winded answer there but i suppose at the moment there are some green shoots and what the government are doing to support industry i'm just not sure it's being channeled in the right place yeah no it, it, it'd be interesting be interesting to uh, learn more i guess is that is it, you know is that is it rolls out and some of the findings are reported but obviously we talk about the government you know what can employers do more you know a lot a lot we, we i see on linkedin and other other things almost com people complaining about, you know, skills gap and all the rest of it. Surely it's up to businesses to take it by the scruff of the neck and, you know, implement it themselves. Yeah, I mean, it's got to be an integrated approach, hasn't it? Um, business has, has definitely got to step up to the plate and start investing in rather than seeing it as a risk, you know. Um, it's, it's the cliche, cliche old saying, isn't it? What about if we train them and they leave? Or what about if we train, don't train them and they stay? You know, we have got to invest for the future. So business has definitely got a massive role to play in, in the investment for the future. But then that, they've got to be given the environment to play in to allow them to be able to invest in those skills as well. And that's where the government comes in. And the other integrated approach, which is a, a tri-party angle there, is, is us as the providers. You know, it's got to be an integrated approach that we're all delivering for the same output. And I think that's been a failing in the past, especially over the various quangos that have popped up. And even when you look at the local um, delivery base of providers, what's being delivered, how are the funds channeling down to be able to get to market and how are business being made aware of the opportunities available and then those take being taking up those opportunities to advance their workforce so yeah businesses have definitely got a massive role to play because effectively that's why we're all here yeah absolutely we we, we agree yeah we agree with that we're we we run in apprenticeship programs ourselves you know i think they're some of our best guys are actually apprentices and ex-apprentices so you've got you've just got to do it you've got to look after your own business and don't expect somebody else to do it for you but Gareth, appreciate your time. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Maybe we'll catch up again later this year when you've got this this news you can tell us. And But yeah, thanks for coming on. All the best for the rest of the year and speak soon. Stay safe. Thank you very much, John. Keep up the good work. Another great guest, Stuart, is a top guy, Gareth. He certainly is, and it's um, fascinating to hear about both the company but also the industry, which is obviously vitally important for the manufacturing sector. Yeah, absolutely. So if, if you want to be on the show, please drop us an email, podcast at mtdmfg.com. We'd love to have you on, whether you're a large company or a smaller company. You know, we, we're not biased on this show. And also, please download the app, the MTD MFG app. It's available for Android uh, and Apple at all the usual places. But back on with the news, Stuart. Marine Specialised Technology that secured a £36 million patrol craft contract. Absolutely. Quite a short story. Um, the Liverpool-based firm will deliver 18 new police patrol craft for the MOD and Gibraltar Defence Police Forces to be used around all Navy bases in the UK and Gibraltar. The £36 million contract will create and sustain more than 50 jobs. Um it wouldn't be a podcast if we didn't mention Bentley Motors. <laughs> They've just opened up one of their new facilities we've been talking about for some months. Absolutely. Well, we'll keep mentioning. We, we tried cheese, Jay. No one sent us cheese. So I'm sure Bentley will send us one in due course. So the, the luxury car makers officially opened a new excellence centre for vehicle finish at its factory and crew. Every Bentley built at the plant will now be finished in a new facility by a specialist team prior to being signed off for delivery to customers around the world. Depending on the model, each car undergoes a 500 to 650 point list that takes more than two hours to complete. The result of this passion for quality is the fact, and it, I find this astonishing, that more than 80% of all Bentleys ever made are still on the road. An incredible statistic. It, it, it is astonishing, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, the, the, next, the, the next story, aggregate industries, 
it's a company you know I come across quite a lot, but I had no idea how big they were. A huge company, I guess. More houses being built, so you need more concrete. Absolutely, um, huge organisation. Um, it's part of its ongoing plan to expand its concrete offering across the Midlands. Aggregate Industries has opened a new ready mix concrete plant in Coalfield, Warwickshire, one of the building material manufacturers' largest plants to date. Um, and this, the launch of this new facility is part of the Swiss headquartered um, strategy to bolster its footprint across the region. Um, as um, there's an awful lot of high-profile commercial and infrastructure projects taking place in, in the in the West Midlands. And Symphony Group, uh, they're looking to expand in Barnsley. Tell us a little more. Yeah, we're, we're going from cars, concrete. We're, we're now on furniture. Um, so GMI Construction has been awarded a major contract by Symphony to build a new 332,626 square feet um, production warehouse for those interested, adjacent roughly. to its existing site. <laughs> roughly, yeah, a couple of uh, inches on that. Uh, adjacent to existing sites in Barnsley. The Yorkshire-based firm is the UK's largest privately owned manufacturer of fitted kitchen, bedroom and bathroom furniture with a turnover exceeding 280 million, over 1,500 employees. The building schedule will take 38 weeks and the development is expected to create well over 100 jobs. Some very positive news coming out of the latest CBI Industrial Trends, uh, trend Survey. Uh, what, what's it about? Yeah, the rebound in manufacturing activities gathered pace in the three months of June with output growth accelerating its fastest pace on record. Um, I think that, to, to put that into context, I think the, the, the trend survey goes back to about 1975 from memory and order books um, are at the strongest for over 30 years. So, you know, fantastic news. According to the latest, um, and this is all, Related to the latest monthly CBI Industrial Trend Survey, businesses are also reporting growth in 15 out of 17 manufacturing subsectors, and more, as importantly, expect this to continue into the next quarter. And uh, final one for me, but I believe you've got some uh, some breaking news, Joe. Yeah, well, I, I love doing this podcast and spreading the good word, you know, the, the good work of UK manufacturing. I mean, we don't get time to cover all stories, unfortunately. So the first thing I want to say really is go to mtdmfg.com. Um, take a look at, you know, all the news stories we haven't covered today on there. The, the, there's new stories every day. But yeah, we just heard about a hypercar um, being manufactured in the UK and uh, we'll bring, we'll tell you more about it next week, I guess. So if you want to learn more about the latest hypercar, you've, you've, uh, you've got to tune back in next week. Great incentive. Yeah, absolutely. But Stuart, many thanks to you as always. It's a um, big, big thank you to uh, Gareth Jones and Incom Training. But as always, the biggest thank you goes to you at home. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to the Great British Manufacturing Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a rating and a review. You can find us on Twitter using at MTDMFG and at Jefferson underscore MFG.